Hey friends, in this video we'll be taking a look at Heat Pedal to the Metal. Since lighter games are quite up my alley and would rarely stay up for so long in the hotness section of BGG, I got pretty curious and eventually checked it out myself. I'll first go over the rules of this game and then we'll compare it to Flame Rouge at the end. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Heat Pedal to the Metal is a 1 to 6 player board game where you compete in a Grand Prix race. You first get to choose one of the 4 available race tracks in the game. For the sake of this rule stitch, let's say that we chose this USA map. Each player is then given a car of their preferred color, which are placed on these numbered starting areas randomly. You then will also be given a player mat of matching color, a gear stick mini which is placed on position 1 right here, a starting deck of 18 cards, and 6 identical hit cards placed face up here. And finally, everyone draws 7 cards from their shuffled deck. You are now ready to play the game. To win this game, you have to be the first person to lap the track twice. But since you almost always have multiple people finishing on the same round, it's going to be who's furthest ahead instead. So how do you drive your car forward? Well, by playing these cards. If you play this number 3 card, your car simply moves 3 spaces forward. Easy, right? Each round, players will follow these 9 steps as depicted on the player boards. The first 2 steps are done simultaneously, while the other 7 are done turn by turn. They might look a bit overwhelming, but trust me, they are pretty easy and quick to do. The first step allows you to shift your current gear 1 or 2 spots away. What's this for? Well, the gear that you are on determines how many cards you have to play for that round. So if you are on gear 2, you have to play 2 cards. This is a free action unless you move your gear 2 spots away, which will cost you 1 hit card to do. Hit cards are paid simply by moving the same amount of hit cards from your hit sink area right here to your discard pile. Anyway, once you have shifted your gear in phase 1, we move on to the second step where we choose the cards that we want to play this round. Once everyone has selected their cards, they are then revealed at the same time. And that is it for step 2. Step 3 and onwards is where you take turns moving your car forward. The player that's ahead on the track will always resolve of their full turn first. In case of ties, the car closest to the double lines always moves first. So in this case, the turn order would look like this. Since we are first, we'll go ahead and play the 4 and 3 cards that we chose, which allows us to move 7 spaces forward. Other cards that could have stood in the way like this wouldn't have blocked you from moving forward. This by the way does not end your turn, as we have to resolve all the way to step 9. Step 4 is the adrenaline step that lets us optionally move 1 space ahead, but only if we are the last player at the start of the round, or the last 2 players in 5 plus player games. You also get 1 point of cooldown in this case, which lets you return 1 hit card from your hand into the hit sink pile. Since we are first this round, we won't be eligible to do step 4. Step 5 is the react phase, where you basically activate all the symbols that you gain this round. For the base standard game, this will be the cooldown and the boost symbol. You get cooldowns from phase 4 and your gear position. Since we are on gear 2, we have 1 cooldown for this round. Though we have no hit cards on our hand, so this doesn't really benefit us. You would always want to remove hit cards from your hand since they are basically duds and cannot be discarded any other way. Boosting on the other hand is always available no matter which gear you are on but it will cost you one hit to do. When you boost, you keep revealing the top card of your deck until you get one of these cards with an odometer symbol. The rest of the cards are then discarded while this one gets added to your movement this round. In this case, 3 more spaces for a total of 10 spaces. Boosting basically adds a random 1, 2, 3 or 4 extra move as these are the only cards with the odometer symbol. Also, when you play one of these stress cards as part of your phase 2, you will do the exact same boost mechanic to see how many moves forward that card gives you. But you don't have to pay heat to play that card. Then we have step 6 or the slipstream phase that checks if you're next to or right behind a car at this point. If you are, you may move exactly 2 spaces forward. But since we don't fulfill the condition this round, we won't be getting the slipstream bonus. And then we have step 7, the check corner step. You only do step 7 if you cross one of these corners with a speed limit. We actually didn't cross any corners this round. But say that for the next round, we played this number 4 card and boosted for 3 more. With our total speed of 7, we have now crossed the corner. But since our total speed is still within the speed limit of 7, we're all good and nothing happens. However, if we instead had gotten a 4 card for the boost instead of 3, we'll be moving 8 spaces total instead, which goes over the total speed limit. When this happens, we would have to pay the difference in hit cards, which is only 1 in this case. The only movement that does not count during this check is the slipstream bonus. So if there was a car here and we decided to take the slipstream bonus, we would still only have to pay 1 heat card instead of 3 because the slipstream bonus is not counted. If you have to pay heat but you don't have enough heat cards on your heat sink pile, your car will explode and you will instantly die. This is obviously just a joke, but imagine how cool it would be if you can actually die in game. Unfortunately, no one's dead and your car instead just spins out. When this happens, your car is returned back just behind the corner that causes the spin out. And because this is a 
stressful experience for you medically, you'll also then permanently gain a number of stress cards depending on your gear level when you spawn out. And finally, your gear position drops back down to 1. And with that, we are done moving our card this round. Step 8 or the discard phase lets you discard as many cards as you want from your hand. But you cannot discard the stress or heat cards this way as depicted by the no discard symbol. All the cards you played or revealed this round are also discarded onto the same pile. And finally, step 9 or the replenish step lets you draw back to your hand limit of 7 cards. If your deck is empty and you have to keep drawing, you simply reshuffle your discard pile to form a new deck to keep drawing from. This is also how the hit cards eventually go from the discard pile to your hand. As we have finished all 9 steps of our turn, it is now the next player ahead's turn to complete steps 3 to 9 just like we did. Once everyone has completed their turn this round, we check if anyone has completed the race. If not, we begin the next round by repeating steps 1 to 9 all over again. Otherwise, we check to see who's furthest ahead past the finish line and that player will be the winner of the game. And that's it for the base game. There are several modules that you can add to it. The first one is a bunch of these unique cards that you will draft before the game to replace these 3 cards from your starting deck. These cards come with interesting effects such as increasing your slipstream bonus by 2 more for a total of 4 or increasing the speed limit of corners by 2. Then we have the weather and road conditions module which applies a random weather to your track that slightly changes your starting cards. Also, a random tile will be placed on each of the track's corner. Some of these simply modifies the speed limits, though some of them will have this symbol which will instead affect the whole section between this corner and the next corner. In this case, this weather token indicates that this whole section is affected by the track's weather which disables the cooldown action completely. And finally, you have the championship module which applies the first two modules we just talked about and lets you play a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back race using three or even four racing tracks. This mode also comes with its own in-game quote-unquote mini quests that could reward you with these one use sponsorship cards or even points when you fulfill the requirements. Your rank in each track is converted into points and you win by having the most points after you played all three or four maps. And that's all there is to Heat. So how good or bad is Heat? Now I'm sure you knew through whatever smart ass title I decide to give this video that I'm not impressed with this game. Mostly because the game felt like it plays itself or the choices seem very obvious. You basically repeat these two things all game. One, approach a corner as much as you can, ideally placing your car right behind it. This is because you were too far to cross it and or it costs way too many hit cards to cross. And two, you actually cross the corner as far ahead as you reasonably can. You can probably argue on what's the reasonable amount of heat to pay to cross the corners, but in most situations, it's pretty obvious if you should be crossing the corner or not. In fact, a lot of your games will play like 1-2-1-2-1-2-1-2 one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, with the occasional 1-1-2 one, one, when you have a very long road without a corner. The only sort of smart slash interesting move that I could find is when you can cross two corners in one turn, specifically in this section of the Great Britain map. You can cross any of these two corners with minimum heat if you utilize the slipstream mechanic and it's actually pretty satisfying to pull off. You cannot do this on any of the other tracks by the way, probably my favorite track because of this. After knowing which number you're going to do this turn, you have to play the right cards and maybe change gears which are also very easy to figure out. Say that this is your hand and you wanted to move 10 steps. You can do 4-3-3 three, three on gear 3 or I don't know 4-3-2-1 on gear 4. You know, just simple maths. Even the gear changes are very obvious. If you're approaching a corner this turn, you'll obviously want to gear down because you're going to cross it next turn. But if you're crossing a corner this turn and the next corner is far away, you will wanna gear up. Plus, gear 2 and 3 are very safe gear spots because you are within reach of all gear positions next round. The only time you will have difficulty in this part is if either you have a really bad hand or your boost and stress draws are bad, both of which are determined by luck. And even if you do fall a bit behind, the game has a lot of catch-up mechanics to get you back on track. Not only do they give the players behind a push, but there's also no incentives on being ahead. One, you'll never get to slipstream, and two, you don't really block anyone. So anytime that you are ahead, you kinda just become a vaulting pole for everyone else. And since they are now ahead and gets to move first, it is now your time to slipstream off them. So it becomes like this perpetually meaningless back and forth which doesn't add anything to the game. Yes, this is done to balance the game but it feels kinda overdone to the point where as long as you don't do anything stupid like playing your cards blind or whatever, it almost doesn't matter how you play the game. And just to top this all off, most if not all of my 6 games of heat have boiled down to who's got the better hand in the last few rounds. If you manage to draw big numbers just before the finishing line, you'll probably win. And if you don't, well, tough luck, that's it. Now I know some of you would say, oh that's why you set up for those last crucial rounds. Yes, but I don't think you need 2 laps to do it. I would say at least the first lap still does not matter. And plus, luck will always play a big role since you'll be furiously
constantly discarding your cards in hopes of getting the big numbers in the last few rounds. Honestly, playing Heat feels a lot less like racing in a Grand Prix and a lot more like doing simple maths over and over again. The only redeeming feature of this game are these various upgrade cards. They provide some variety and interesting mechanics which are desperately needed in this game. They also make each player's deck a bit more unique, which is pretty nice. Don't ever play this game without these upgrade cards. For real. The weather and road conditions module offers a similar kind of variety, but they just feel like a worse version of the upgrade cards. The module's effects are kind of weak in comparison, and it doesn't offer the same deck uniqueness as the cards. Pretty underwhelming, but I guess it's not bad. I've never played the back-to-back -back championship module and probably never will, because one map is repetitive enough for me. Without the upgrade cards, I would give this game a 3 out of 10. It just feels very shallow and repetitive. But when you add the upgrade cards in, I would give it a 5 out of 10. The module does help the game a lot, but ultimately cannot carry it. Anyway, it's now time to change lanes and talk about Flame Rouge. Flame Rouge is also a racing game, but instead of a looping track, you now have a different start and end point. And instead of controlling a car, you will now be maneuvering with bikes. Two of them, in fact. Each cyclist has their own unique deck. At the start of your turn, you will draw four cards from one of the decks. As you can probably guess, the number on each card tells you how many spaces you move forward. Though, unlike Heat, you can only play one card for each cyclist each turn. After you have chosen a card for one of them, you then repeat the exact same thing for the other cyclist. Once everyone has chosen one card for each cyclist secretly, they are then revealed at the same time. You then move the cyclists ahead first according to their cards just like Heat. The cards that you use for movement each turn will always be removed from the game completely. Yes, all cards in this game are one use. The other three cards that was now chosen are then discarded face up at the bottom of each respective deck. They are placed face up so you'll know when to eventually reshuffle. Once everyone has moved, we are going to check for slip streams. Slip streaming in this game happens in groups, which are simply cyclists that are in a cluster. So in this case, there are currently three groups. Slip streaming starts from the group that is behind. It only procs if the group has exactly one empty space between them and the group ahead of them. Slip streaming will move the entire group ahead by one space like so, thereby joining the two groups. But it doesn't end here because you also check if this bigger group can also slip stream forward. If it again fulfills the condition, which it does, the bigger group then moves forward another space, thereby forming this huge group. As you can see, slip streaming in this game cascades, but the one in heat doesn't. After slip streaming ends, you now add penalties to whoever is ahead in each group. In this case, it will be these two cyclists. What this means is, they will both add an exhaustion card with a low number into their deck. And that's basically how a round goes in this game. You keep playing until one of the cyclists reach the finishing line. There are these simple modules that you can add as well. The red boxes represent an ascent, which limits your total movement to 5 if you touch the terrain at any point during your turn. Also, no slip streaming if you're on it. The blue ones on the other hand represent a descent. If you start your turn on it, any card you play that is lower than 5 will all become 5 movements. So playing an exhaustion card right here is a slam dunk. And that's all there is to Flame Rouge. So out of the two games, which one would I recommend you to get? Well, that would be... None of them. No, seriously. Despite the differences in the two games that I briefly mentioned, they play very similarly to each other. So my complaints are also very similar for both games. In Flame Rouge, you need to stick behind a group as much as possible because the game will punish anyone that is ahead. But since you will never know exactly where everyone else will go at any given turn, you're just mostly guessing and hoping for the best. You keep doing this until you are close enough to the finish line where you finally get to play your big movement cards in hopes of crossing the finish line first. There are just no interesting decisions to be made in this game ever. If I have to choose between the two, I would definitely go for Heat, mostly because of the upgrade cards. Honestly though, for a racing game, I much prefer Quest of Eldorado. With a bit of added complexity, because it has a deck building mechanic, you're getting an infinitely more interesting game compared to the two. And here's one of my older videos reviewing the game. Anyway, that's all for this video. Check out my channel for more reviews like this, and leave a comment down below. Let me know, am I just wrong? Is Heat actually great? And that's it, see ya!